The leaves are falling off the trees. May the forest be with you. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Well, Stacy, it's time to move heaven and earth, as I call it. It's plant moving time. Don't feel guilty if a plant wasn't in the right place in the first place. Bust a move. However well you plan, there will always be a plant that isn't quite in the right place in your garden. This is the time that we can do something about it. I don't know about you, but I love moving plants. It's like a fresh start. I have no problem with it, but I have discovered that um, plants definitely do better when they have some time to get established. Mm -hmm. And so every time you move something, it does set it back a bit. But, you know, I think it's really important that everyone understand that in gardening, you do not have to get it right the first time. Right. If you plant an oak tree, yes. If you plant a sugar maple, yeah, you're probably not going to transplant those. But in terms of shrubs, perennials, even annuals, vegetables, you know, you don't need to get it right. And few people do get it right. And even if you think something looks right, well, the person who planted it might not think that. They just didn't move it. So, you know, and, and another thing about moving plants that's so common is that most sites tend to become shadier over time. Sure. Trees sure. grow and mature. Yep. And so, you know, what was once a perfect spot for a lilac because it got at least six hours of sun as your neighbor's tree or whatever grew and the, sp and the spot became shadier. Now your lilac's no longer flowering. You got to move it. Yeah. Exactly. And as Cheryl Crow sang in her song, a change will do you good. And in some cases for your plants, a change will do you good. Now, here in Michigan, where we're broadcasting from, I was just looking at, uh, you know, forecasts here over this week, overcast with drizzle, temperatures in the 50s. Perfect. Perfect. For moving plants, yeah. right? Yep, for sure. And, you know, ideally you want to do it when they're dormant or going dormant. Why? Because then they don't have to worry. The plant doesn't have to worry about supporting all its foliage, trying to grow flowers, doing all of this other stuff. It's in full root growth mode. The leaves are falling anyway if they haven't already fallen off. And so when you move it at this time of year or in or late winter, early spring is also a good time because it's still dormant. Um, it just doesn't have to devote its resources to so much stuff. It can d just devote its resources to growing new roots and recovering from being transplanted. Because the soil's warm, but the air temperature is getting cold. Exactly. And, you know, you can do some pruning too. Pruning any unruly parts of a plant not only promotes plant health, uh, but also makes it easier to move. Some people will pre-cut roots on plants, mm -hmm. knowing the plant's going to be moving maybe a few months ahead of time. And uh, the theory there is that the roots would develop some beneficial hair roots. What do you think about that? So a lot of people, they call that air pruning. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to make sort of an air layer or an air barrier um, around the plant and where it is. So they're kind of getting ready to dig it. I mean, I don't think it hurts. Um, I think that no matter what, the plant is still going to have to re re recover uh, from being moved. And yes, well, that will, to some extent, perhaps uh, cause the plant to branch within the root ball, you know, that since you've severed it from mm -hmm. the from the outside. It's not a bad idea, but not doing it wouldn't stop me from moving something. Now, if you're going to be moving some larger plant, obviously, smaller plants are easier to move. Larger or more established plants, uh, you want to take as much of the root ball along as possible uh, to avoid uh, transplant shock. And I found that having a good tarp, a tarp mm. is your friend. I like the slide method where I can just kind of roll it onto the tarp and then drag that tarp to the new location, which if you're smart, you have prepared that new location before digging up and moving the plant to its new location. Definitely. And that is so important for um, people who have soil like we do out here on the lakeshore where it is so sandy, you couldn't really get a root ball to save your life. And at least in my soil, I don't know about yours. It's so sandy. So yes, some soil does cling to the roots, but it's certainly not like if you've ever purchased like a, a bald and burlap tree or shrub where you've got that nice compacted clay root ball. Now, our friends who have clay soil are thinking, oh my gosh, transplanting is a total nightmare because I'm digging up a 500 pound root ball because of all the soil clinging to it. Whereas we can't really quite get any, but 
I do absolutely 100% agree with you on preparing the new spot as as closely as possible. Of course, you don't know exactly how big the root ball is going to be when you dig it, um, but you you have to try. Your, your goal is to minimize the amount of time that the plant spends out of the ground because you talked about hair roots, and hair roots can mean like the very fine roots that you can see, but it also roots do have literal hair, not literal hairs like hair on your head, but hair, hairs on mm-hmm. them, and those hairs are so, so crucial to absorbing water, to um, absorbing, taking up nutrients from the soil. And the longer those are exposed to air and light, the more of them are going to die and, again, cause the plant to have to work harder to recover from the transplanting. So whatever you can do to minimize the amount of time that that root ball sees the sun, the better. Fantastic. Yeah, microscopic uh, hair roots. As we sit here uh, talking about moving I can't help it. A dad joke comes to mind. Uh, What did the artist say to his vehicle that would not move? Um, I give up. Van Gogh. Okay. I lead into my limerick here. (laughs) I know that's so bad, but I love dad jokes. I can't help it. Okay. So my limerick on moving plants. A new location would behoove. This shrub that I need to move, it's out of control. Twigging means I will be digging. I just hope it will approve. I'll move to a location that suits and show off its attributes. I'll dig, tug, cajole, and its feelings console while I try to remember the roots. I mean, try and take as much of that root ball with you when you can. As you can. And, you know, I think in terms of doing that, it's helpful to think about how far those really go around the plant. And it is much wider than you might think. Now, there is a point, of course, where you can't be disturbing other plants that you're leaving in, in place. And, you know, the reality of the plant that you have to move sometimes doesn't allow you to go there. But I would say try to start a little further out from the plant than your initial instinct might be. Um, and if it turns out that, you know, there aren't any roots there and the soil's just, you know, falling and you're not getting any roots, then you can go a little bit closer. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Now, of course, if you're moving plants because you're moving to a new home, here are a few things to think about because you can't take all the plants with you. That has always bothered me when I've moved. You can't take them all with you, and they're your babies. So move hard-to-find rare plants, move plants with sentimental value, and uh, uh, move a few plants that make your garden feel like home. Yeah, that's a really good one, because I think everyone does have the plants that they're just theirs. You know, they they planted one time on a whim and it's just they've come to love it and that really does make you feel like you have that continuity with you know your older garden Um, but you know speaking of transplanting for moving I moved in July and I had to just dig everything up and hope for the best and it it worked out okay okay but you know again a a lot of times we were talking about this here in late October where it is an ideal time to move but sometimes you know what you just got to do what you got to do and hope for the best. And that's, that's gardening because we garden in the real world as horticulturists. We try to give people best case advice or, you know, here's the best practice, but ultimately life sometimes is not about best practices. It's about doing what you need to do at the time. It's true. And of course, yes, autumn and spring are probably your best time to, uh, to move plants. Of course, with perennials, it's easy and you can get two for the price of one. There can be some division, uh, as you do it, divide and conquer. Of course, you don't want to move a perennial when it's in flower. So in the dormant season is probably the best time to do it. Vines, you would cut those back really hard before you dig them out of the ground to move them to a new position. And they obviously will recover from that. They'll do what they do. And then finally, Stacy, there are some plants that simply do not like to move. Uh, you can move peonies, and I've successfully moved peonies, but arguably they really don't like to move, or magnolias, or yuccas. Good luck. Oh, I've, I've moved yuccas before, but, you know, you do have a good, so yuccas have like a long kind of taproot and anything that has that long taproot is going to be harder 
to move. Um, but what I've also found when, when I've heard that advice, like, oh, this doesn't like to be moved. It's not that you can't do it successfully. It's that it takes it so long to recover yeah. from having been moved that it might just be worth starting with a new plant rather than waiting, you know, the three to five years for it to finally get over the stress of move. Because yeah. it is stress, even if you minimize it. You know, it is stressful for the plant. Stressful, but sometimes you got to move. Sometimes I heard a uh, motivational speaker said, if you don't like where you are, move. You are not a tree. I guess he makes a good point there. Plants on trial coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. At this point in the show, we put one of the Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs on trial, which means we're going to tell you about it, and you get to decide if you're going to add it to your landscape or not, your garden, whatever you call it. And, uh, you know, I always try to tie it into whatever the theme of the show mm -hmm. is. And today I picked a rose. I picked Oh So Easy Italian Ice Rose. And one of the reasons that I picked it is I wanted to kind of address uh, the ease of transplanting because we get so, so many questions at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs about, I planted this, you know, like I was saying in the previous uh, segment, um, a lot of places get shadier over mm -hmm. time and people, right. people need to move them or they, and this is common, I am just as guilty of this as anyone else. You buy a plant, it's a cute little one gallon and you look at the tag and you're like 15 feet. I don't think so. <laughs> and then a couple of years go by. And then next thing you know, it is indeed 15 feet mm -hmm. and you have to move it. Well, hopefully before it gets to be quite that tall. So um, I think that especially shrubs and most perennials are easier to move than most people think, at least in terms of the root mass, right? Like you aren't going to need an excavator. You're not going to need a backhoe. You will be able to successfully move most shrubs that are, you know, even reasonably mature. Um, and that's true of roses. Roses mm -hmm. are from a root standpoint, very easy to move. From a physical ability standpoint, things could get a little bit trickier. So I am going to get into some tips on transplanting roses. But first, I want to kind of paint the picture of Oh So Easy Italian Ice Rose and tell you why I picked this out of all of the many, many roses in the Proven Winners Color Choice line as today's plant on trial. And you've heard us say before that roses really have a second wind or a second summer in when fall comes around. The um, longer nights, the cooler temperatures just completely change the color of roses. It's amazing. I have oh so easy roses. And as you get into November, it, that's a good way of putting it. Second wind. They're yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. Even as late as November, if you have not had a severe mm -hmm. frost yet, they will continue to open buds. Now, they probably won't be setting any new buds, but any buds that they did set over October, and we've had a warmer than typical October here in West Michigan, um, any of those buds they set, they'll continue to open. I mean, I have seen roses absolutely coated with frost mm -hmm. and plants still just like, eh, whatever. So, oh, so easy Italian ice rose is sort of like... Um, the color coloration is similar to one of the most famous roses of all time. And that is peace, the peace rose. Sure. Um, so it kind of has like a creamy yellow center and that sort of graduates out to orange and then finally pink at the tips of the petals. And oh, so easy Italian ice rose is absolutely beautiful when it blooms in summer, but the color that it takes on when it blooms in fall is really just something that you have to see. And um, it's not that it's like, you know, gaudy, but it's just so much brighter. And, you know, with the, the moody fall light and everything, it's just sort of shining out in the landscape. And I have found that particularly, I think the pinks on Oh So Easy Italian Ice are mm. what really get, you know, the volume just gets turned up. And, you know, it's, it's just like a totally different experience. And that's one of the things I love so much. And I think I talk about this a lot on the show when I'm talking about plants. I love plants that have these changes. Yeah. I love something that's a little bit unpredictable um, and that, you know, you're not just like, okay, well, yeah, that rose is beautiful, but it looks the exact same as it did a month ago. No, I don't I want something to, you know, be of its time. And I think Oh So Easy Italian Ice Rose is a perfect example of that. I think it's why people love fall color. It's just all the changes and the change and it's vibrant. And when you can add plants to the landscape that add to that vibrancy, wow, 
Yeah. Bonus. And especially an unexpected color, like mm-hmm. those pinks in orange and yellow, you know, they're not the, the as, um, they're a little bit more on the pastel side rather than the super vivid tones you're seeing in the landscape, but they just somehow feel right at home in the autumn landscape. Now it's about a two and a half foot tall and wide rose. So it's a shrub rose, a landscape rose, uh, as we call it. And basically what that means is that it's very, very sturdy. It's not going to be sort of one of those narrow vase shaped roses, like a hybrid tea. It's going to be kind of like a nice two and a half foot by two and a half foot square, um, of a plant. And of course, as all the rest of the oh so easy roses are very disease resistant. And when we're testing for disease resistant, disease resistance on roses through through for the proven winners color choice line what we do is we start in our uh, greenhouse trialing plants and we put all of the plants on trial close together these are real plants on trial not plants on trial on the show all the plants are trialing close together we do overhead watering we don't spray anything and we're just kind of trying to let nature take its course and do a natural selection any plant that under those conditions is going to get powdery mildew or black spot will automatically take out of the trial. Sure. Yeah. You know, so it's just let, let's see what happens under the worst possible conditions. And then if things make it through that, then we start moving them on and evaluating other aspects. How do they do in the landscape? How do the flowers look? So it's important to us, especially for the Oh So Easy series, that all of these plants are disease resistant. And that means they're not likely to get black spot. They're not likely to get powdery mildew, which of course are the big two when it comes to roses and and they don't need deadheading that's another thing that we look for is um you know traditionally things like hybrid tea roses you need to be out there cutting the old stems off um so that they will continue to flower that's not the case with the oh so easy roses well and the bonus uh when we move at this time of the year also stacy is the the winter hardiness of these plants yeah, that's a great, uh, a really great point because most, not all of the oh so easy roses are hardy to USDA zone three or four. So quite, quite hardy. And so you don't really have to worry about moving them. Will they survive winter? They are all on their own roots. So if you're familiar with older roses that might have been grafted and have a different root and top, that's not the case with oh so easy. They're all 100% own root rows. So they will easily be able to stand up to the cold. And yeah, now is a great time to transplant them because they're going to have, you know, it's late October. They're going to have a good six weeks of good growing conditions for their roots to recover. And uh, roses are definitely one of those plants that as we, as they go dormant, will absolutely just put all that energy into their root system and, you know, really be able to recover from that, get that good root system. The rest of the plant is dormant so that when spring does come, they can just come roaring back without a problem. If you're keeping score at home, uh, Stacy's talking about oh so easy Italian ice rose. All of the oh so easy roses, Stacy, I love. I am moving some in my landscaping right now. I don't like moving roses. I'm hoping maybe you have an idea or a pointer for me. <laughs> well, I don't have a magical formula. I don't have a magical trick, but I do have some suggestions. Now, I have to ask you, are you moving these into your new deer compound? Yes, my uh, new deer compound. <laughs> Secure. Safe. <laughs> you know, it's so wild that um, roses are so thorny and so favored by deer. Yeah. There's so many other plants like barberry that deer won't touch because they have thorns, whereas roses... They just, it just does not bother them at all. And people are so surprised when they're like, well, it's covered in thorns. Why would a deer eat this? And not only do they eat it, they devour it. Yeah, tasty. They devour I've heard from a rosarian that they are naturally very high in vitamin C so that the deer almost eat them as like a compulsion. Like they can't resist this like super nutritious um, plant (laughs) that's in front of them. But yeah, in terms of those thorns, that does make them a little bit tricky to move. But I do have a couple tips that will make it hopefully a little bit easier. Okay. Um, Or at least, well, it's always going to be a little painful. So rose gauntlets, you know, rose gauntlets are, are gloves for working with roses that usually go up to your elbow or higher. And they're not just tougher or more durable. Um, they really are much more protective. And the nice thing I like about rose gauntlets is that they typically have a lot more flexibility in the fingers because you need to have good flexibility for pruning roses, exactly. working around roses. You can't just have like that stiff, heavy leather glove that would be protective against the thorns, but not actually let you you know, flex your fingers in and weeding. Underneath oh, oh, that's a rough one. Yeah, yeah. That's rough. So, um, get your rose gauntlets. Definitely do not wear anything knit, no sweaters. Um, <laughs> nothing that those rose thorns are going to snag on at your smoothest, like raincoat, although those can also get snagged by a thorn. 
and then get yourself some rope and um, make a loop. You know, like a double it down so you have a loop at the end, and then um, wrap it around your plant and put the the free end through that loop and cinch it so that you're kind of drawing it up mm. into like a ponytail. And then go ahead and, and wrap that again and give it a knot. So make sure it's a nice long piece of rope. Um, don't use anything that's too soft and synthetic that's going to get caught and drive you crazy, but like a, a good twine or something like that. So for this reason, I do not recommend pruning your roses before you move them. Oh, really? Yeah, because you want to have more to work with. You want to lasso them. You want to lasso them. This is basically what we're doing. Yes, exactly what we're suggesting here. Wow. Lasso up your rose. Hopefully you've already got that hole uh, prepared. Go ahead and transplant it. Keep it lassoed until you've completely filled in so that you have room to get in there and, okay. and backfill it properly. And then you can unleash your lasso. Don't try to untie it. Just get a knife <laughs> and make quick work of it. And that's when you can go ahead. And, and if, if it's fall, you probably want to save your pruning until spring. But if you were to transplant your rose in spring, that's when you would want to go ahead and prune it and get it ready for the season. And it should go on without missing a beat. And you should hopefully only have a few scratches to show for your ordeal. Awesome. You rose to the occasion. Nice. So listen, we're going to put pictures of Oh So Easy Italian Ice Rose on our website, on our Instagram page, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we've got the garden mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's my favorite part of the show because we're really going to simplify gardening for you and answer your garden questions. We do have, again, some big, juicy questions to answer with big, juicy answers. So <laughs> I want to get right to it. But if you do have a question for us, you can reach us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or just use the contact form at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And uh, we will try to get to your question. And what do we got in the mailbag today, Rick? Well, Stacy, Jim sends us a juicy question. I have chestnut trees I planted 10 years ago. This year I'm getting nut production on three of them, but they're not what I expected. They're all singular nuts that look more like big spiny acorns than the expected burrs. The leaves look like chestnut, but not the nuts. Are these just immature trees? Pictures are attached. What do I have? Oh, geez. Well, I think this is an important question. And I, I do tell people when I respond to them with their gardening questions often, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. And I really do. I really do. But I, I do try to break it gently. So, Jim, dun, dun, I, dun. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. But you those pictures you sent are not chestnuts. Um, and we will put those pictures, of course, on the website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. If you watch the YouTube version, you will be seeing those as well. Um, Jim, what you have, or at least the pictures that you sent, are of sawtooth oak, Quercus acutissima. Um, so the foliage does look identical, pretty much identical. I, in fact, if I, I'm not super familiar with chestnuts because unfortunately our beautiful Native American chestnut did go extinct nearly. It's working on coming back. But the Chinese chestnut is the primarily one, right. primary one that's planted nowadays. Um, but the foliage looks almost identical to the Chinese chestnut. Um, and therefore, it's possible that there was a mix-up at the nursery um, and, you know, that the plants were just, I don't know where you ordered these from or where you got them. Um, Quercus acutissima, the sawtooth oak, is not native to North America. It's actually native to Asia, so mm -hmm. probably not dug out of the woods or anything like that. But So it's possible it was just an innocent mix-up at the nursery um, because, again, the foliage looks so similar. Or it's possible that um, there was just a, a miscommunication. And this often happens, and this is not would not be the first time I've seen it happen. It's so important to try to use botanical names. Even if you see yourself as a complete layperson, um, I'm not a professional horticulturist, I'm not a botanist, why would I need to know the botanical names? It's so worth looking up the botanical names of the plants that you want to make sure they are consistent because one of the beauty of scientific names is that they are the same all around the world. So if you were to go to an arboretum in another, in another country, they might put the common name in their language and you might not know what it means at all. But if you're recognizing that scientific name on the tag or whatever it is, you know what it is because that yep. is universal. That's what Carl Linnaeus intended all along. And it's important to be acutissima with your identification. It definitely is, especially when, like Jim, you have 10 years into the plant. So the good news is that the sawtooth oak is still a beautiful tree. 
the squirrels are going to love it. If not, uh, you you will not have chestnuts roasting on an open fire, yeah. I fear. Uh, at least not from these. Now, it's possible since you said you only have three of them that are actually showing um, these these seed, the acorns. Um, maybe there was a mix-up, and the other ones are actually chestnut. It's, it's really hard to say. Um, there could be any number of reasons why some are more mature than others. But just to before we be, let you go here on this issue, I do want to make another case for learning your scientific names because, okay, you have Quercus acutissima known as a sawtooth oak. You thought you were getting the Chinese chestnut, Castania mollis. There is a North American native oak called the chestnut oak that does not actually look so much like a chestnut, and that is Quercus montana. So um, (laughs) this is all very confusing, I know. We're going to put it in the show notes, so it's all mapped out there. But again, this is why it's so important to do your research, find out that scientific name, and then search by that. If you're looking online, if you're going to the garden center, any good plant company, their tags should have the scientific name on there so that you're sure of what you're buying. So, Jim, I'm sorry they're not chestnuts, but you do have beautiful acorns, beautiful uh, oak trees, and um, like I said, The squirrels will at least be grateful. Keep us posted on those other ones, though, as they hopefully start to flower and bear fruit. And chestnut flowers are actually much more um, showy than oak flowers. Mm -hmm. They're white. They bloom in sort of early summer. Very, very fragrant. So you might know sooner and not just have to wait until you see the seeds. Remember that one hit wonder song by Thomas Dolby, Blinded by Science? Yeah, she blinded me with science. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I feel. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm really sorry, Jim. (laughs) I I am sorry, too. It's fascinating. Okay, Nicole, a few questions about overwintering plants in containers. Thanks for your question, Nicole. She has a couple questions about overwintering in Ilex crenata patio box, Japanese holly. Uh, was given to her by one of her professors, uh, planted it in a large planter. She's wondering the best way to protect it through winter while it's still trying to uh, be established. Also started some lavender and gustafolia from seed this spring. It's in a smaller planter. I'm wondering the best way to overwinter. Bring it indoors. Right. So, uh, no, I am I am very opposed to bringing hardy plants indoors for I winter. I agree, 100%. Now, I did have someone write me the other day, and she was like, well, you can, I've, I have overwintered perennial or tropical hibiscus and this, that, and the other. The warmer climate your plant is native to, the more success you're going to have overwintering exactly. it indoors. If the plant is hardy, that is, would normally be able to survive outdoors in your area, it's really, really going to struggle if you bring it indoors. So um, Nicole, in both cases, I do recommend that you keep them outdoors. The challenge here is this. The challenge is going to be keeping the Japanese holly, which is a broadleaf evergreen, wet enough and keeping the lavender dry enough. So um, the lavender cannot deal with winter wetness. So to overwinter the lavender successfully, which by the way, great job starting that from seed. Lavender Mm -hmm. seeds are like the size of dust. So not the easiest thing to grow from seed. I would put that in a very shallow planter so you're not having a lot of soil underneath, just holding on to water. And one of the issues Mm. that happens so often with plants in containers in winter is that you get this ice cube developing, you know, the, the, the mass freezes. And as it starts to thaw, it thaws from the outside in. So you end up with this big ice cube in the center that's going to take a lot longer to thaw than the edges were. And with a lavender, you're getting those rains and just the soil staying really moist and not draining. That is going to cause that lavender to rot. Now, the opposite issue is kind of true for the Japanese holly. What's going to happen, it's an evergreen, so those leaves are just losing water all season long through winter sun, winter wind. Um, But if the ground is frozen or the soil, if the ground's frozen, it can't take up any water to replace that. If the ground is not frozen, but the soil's too dry, it has no water to take up to replace that, and it will end up desiccating. So in this case, I would say try to keep it out of the sun and wind if you can. It still needs the exposure to fresh air and to light, but you just don't want to have it in the bright direct sun where that is really, really just beating down on it and taking away that water. Yeah, With the holly, my opinion is the root should be below ground level. So you heal it in. And if you have a spot on the north side of the house, structural shade protected from wind and wind and sun, like you mentioned, Stacy, I think you can do fine. Yep, and mulch. Mulch will be good on the holly, but don't put it on the lavender. So we'll digest that all in the show notes for you if you have any follow-up questions. Roger asks, I've been out of the country, not able to deadhead my roses now that I'm back. Zone 7A. 
The roses have hips as large as ping pong balls. <laughs> Is it too late to deadhead now and get more blooms before winter? Should I leave the hips? So um, rose hips are something that I think only rosarians really knew about before. Uh, but since these disease-resistant, nonstop blooming landscape roses have come onto the market that don't need deadheading to continue to bloom, people are seeing the hips or berries or seed pods of roses a lot more than they used to. And I love rose hips. They're beautiful. I love them too. Um, they're super beneficial for wildlife. Yeah. And in the case of landscape roses specifically, so shrub roses like what we talked about earlier, I was so easy Italian ice, the rest of the Oh So Easy series, um, it does not stop them from continuing to bloom. Now, there are roses that need to be deadheaded or have those snipped off to continue to bloom, but most roses, not a problem. And at this point in the season, I would not snip them off. I would just Agreed. let them, uh, they contribute great winter Agreed. color. They're, so they can be anywhere from orange to bright red. Um, so really attractive in the landscape. And um, if the birds haven't already eaten them, they certainly will by the time they get softened by a couple of freeze thaws a little bit later in the season. So no sweat, Roger. You're probably already seeing more flowers forming. And you're making the birds happy as well. Yeah, I agree. And rose hips as big as ping pong. Ball. <laughs> you know what ping pong is? Ping pong is 10% hitting the ball, 90% running around the room trying to retrieve the ball. Yeah, that's for sure. Crawling <laughs> under the couch. Where did that thing go? That's ping pong. Yeah, I'm a terrible ping pong player. I just say that right now, <laughs> as my husband unfortunately knows. Uh, so anyway, thank you all so much for your questions. Uh, you can find all of the notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, where you can also send us your question if you have one. We're going to take a little break. Branching news is coming up next, so please stay tuned. Okay, my friends, it's time for branching news. And Stacy, of course, we love fall foliage in October going into November. What I find fascinating is uh, images from space uh, that show you the color in the Northeast. It's pretty Ooh, fascinating to look at. Cool. Yeah, to look at that. Uh, and we're going to put a link on our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. A study from Appalachian State University estimated the annual event of fall color results in about $30 billion in economic impact in the classic sightseeing areas like Vermont. Uh, according to experts at the U.S. Forest Service, of course, a combination of warm, sunny days, cool, crisp nights can help enhance the most vivid colors visible from space. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it is. Pretty cool. Going to the West Coast, a gargantuan western red cedar tree standing 151 feet tall and 17 and a half feet in diameter has been discovered. Flores Island, so that is uh, northwest of Seattle and west of Vancouver, uh, has one of the largest contiguous areas of old growth forest left on Vancouver Island. Uh, this gentleman was walking along and spotted this tree, believed to be more than a 1,000 years old, the find of a lifetime, one of the largest old-growth cedars ever documented in British Columbia. Pretty cool. That's marvelous. The, and, and the pictures are amazing, too. And we're going to put the link uh, on, the, um, on the website. Uh, when you come across something like that, and that area too, when you look at the western uh, red cedars and uh, all the old growth cedars in that area, it takes your breath away. You know, it's and it's so wild to think about a tree just being discovered. Um, but I know when I was uh, in California earlier this summer um, in the giant redwoods, you know, they are still regularly discovering giant redwoods yeah. that out that are bigger than than they thought and. You know, it really is just about the right person coming around at the right time and knowing what they're seeing. Because yeah. other people might have hiked that area and just said, whoa, that's a big tree and moved on. And, you know, it's so it's like you could you could be that person who really realizes what you have and um, and make a new record. Yeah. And it's important. And it's important that it's recorded and that we celebrate these trees. Uh, their survivors is what they are. Yeah. Which brings on a dad joke. So this Ooh. skinny little guy walks into a logger's office, says, I want a job. The guy says, you don't look like a logger. He says, try me. So he hands him an ax, says, there's a large cedar tree out back. Let's see how you do. Comes back two minutes later, the tree is cut down. 
logger says, no way. Two minutes? My best loggers could not do that. Where'd you get your training with an X? The guy says, I got my training in the Sahara forest. The guy says, don't you mean Sahara desert? He says, well, that's what they call it now. <laughs> oh, Dad geez. joke. Let's move along. Let's move to something sad. Oh. This time of year, bird strikes on glass. Oh, bones. gosh. Yeah. Awful. Doesn't that drive you crazy when you see that? It does. And, you know, I, and because they're migrating, the birds are just, their their brains are, I don't, I can't describe it. Their brains are someone else. So I have um, two deer exclosures where I grow my vegetables mm-hmm. and they're just PVC cages that we wrap with, um, with, with window screen. And it works perfectly well to keep the deer out. But uh, the other day I walked out to the garden, it was a sunny day, and I watched bam, bam, two deers in a row or two birds in a row fly directly into that screening. Ouch. Now they bounced right back and they were fine because it was just screen. Right. But I was like, how, these things have been here <laughs> for months at this point. And, you know, fortunately they were okay. But yeah, when it's glass or something hard, it's, uh, yeah. it can be quite traumatic. And this story really hits home, no pun intended. Uh, At least a 1,000 birds died from colliding with one Chicago building in one day. So they kept track. Many of us, I know I've been there many times, McCormick Place Mm -hmm. is the largest convention center in North America, and it's primarily covered in glass. So it's a lethal obstacle for birds. Uh, October 5th of this year, they did the count within 1.5 miles of McCormick Place. uh, At at least 1,000 birds uh, died, others. Uh, injured and uh, and they kept track so anywhere you've got glass you're going to have birds hitting the windows especially during migration season and and uh, this article was quite interesting and we're going to post it on the website it explained that when you have glass in a building the strikes for birds during the day generally occur at the lower level Mm -hmm. especially if you have plants and shrubbery inside Uh, at night of course they become disoriented by the lights and uh, crash into the glass and so there's a lot of work being done by people who are trying to um, maybe anticipate these problems and get some of these buildings to turn off the lights in larger buildings. Uh, We'll put a link there also the work that they're doing in New York where they want to flip the switch on some of these commercial buildings to reduce the number of these bird strikes. Yeah, I have seen some bad bird strikes in my time and uh, it's it's always a heartbreak. Yeah, it is. Because it's not usually, you know, the sparrows or or grackles or something, or not grackles, but starlings, something that, you know, maybe could use a little reduction in the population. It's always something really unique yeah. and, and beautiful. So it's a real tragedy. So something to keep on our radar. Uh, something that's being exposed by the uh, ubiquity of social media, disturbing and frustrating at the same time, is bad behavior at national parks. Oof, yeah, it has been... And I saw something in social media. It sparked outrage recently. There was a lady standing right next to a prone bison on the side of the road, and a few others swarmed mere feet away, snapping pictures with their phones. And right there was a sign two foot away that warns people of the danger uh, not to get close to these animals. As a matter of fact, in this case, I guess there was a ranger that was yelling at her saying, move away because this bison has uh, had charged people before. She was standing right next to this thing. Anything for the perfect selfie, I guess. Oh, my word. I tell you what. Now, of course, bison, I guess, have large humps at their shoulders and a bigger head and a beard uh, compared to uh, a, a buffalo. But, uh, and they can live for a long time, too. Yeah. I don't know about 200 years because that would be a bison tenial, but... They do. I set that one up. Yeah, you did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, But anyhow, (laughs) an American bison that works out at the gym is a buff fellow. Mm -hmm. Two bad jokes for you there. Should I move along? (laughs) Do you got more? I mean. (laughs) No. Oh, I could come up with more. Are we going for quality or quantity here? (laughs) Yeah. Quality or quantity. I thought bison (laughs) tenial was pretty good. All right, see you later, alligators. A Pennsylvania man opened his front door to find a large gator stretched across the threshold. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, it led to at least nine other chompers 
being rescued from a nearby home. Tony Galarski of Kiski Township told WTAE of the moment he learned about the alligator that was spotted on his front porch, the reptile five to six feet long spotted by a neighbor. Now, Gerlaski had just been discharged from the hospital. The neighbor called and said, hey, I don't know, but uh, you better check your back porch there because there's a five to six foot alligator there. I guess there was a neighbor of his who had a dirty backyard pool. The enclosure had broken and uh, the reptiles ran amok. But where did they come from? He was just bringing them in and, according to this article, selling the gators on Craigslist. (gasps) No, that's terrible. Yeah. You can't sell an alligator. I know. It's terrible. He's been arrested. And uh, can you imagine opening up the back door in a six-foot alligator in Pennsylvania, of all places? Yeah, I can see it in Florida, but Pennsylvania, no. So the good news, it it was watering the plants at the time while it was there because it was an irrigator. The uh, neighbor in this case was the instigator, and now the the person collecting these alligators will be dealing with a litigator. Okay, that does it for branching news. That was fun, (laughs) wasn't it? Yeah. We want to thank you for watching and listening to the Gardening Simplified Show. We do want to remind people who listen to the podcast, many people download the podcast on a weekly basis, and thank you very much for doing that or listen on radio. But, uh, Stacy, uh, if you want to check out the show, uh, check it out on YouTube. Yes, you get a little bonus content on YouTube. If we have a guest, you get the whole edition, not just the radio edit. And, of course, Adriana works really hard to put in fun photos like you will be able to see uh jim's acorns that were supposed to be chestnuts if you go to youtube so yeah and you can check out our wardrobe changes week (laughs) after week thank you very much stacy thank you thanks adriana appreciate everything you do adriana robinson our engineer and producer thanks most of all to you for watching and listening to the gardening simplified show